welcome back to the Advent Calendar House, the official holiday podcast for people who make hockey sweaters for vermin. They're out there somewhere, and they all listen to this podcast. And boy, is it their lucky day, because we are responsibly deforesting our way back to 1980 to dig up the holiday special, The Christmas Raccoons. I am generous married couple's permanent house guest in a tree that's clearly bigger on the inside, Mike Westfall. And joining me is barely clothed college graduate son of a lumber baron, Michael D. Giovanni. Hey, Michael. Hello, Mike. Uh, you know, if anyone knows me, they know I always say trees mean money. <laughs> That's right. You do. And a man I may or may not have completely dreamed up. Please welcome Christian Nielsen. Hello, Christian. Hello, Michael. I like to share my dreams with my sister and my dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I forgot the dog. I guess the dog also. We'll get into that later. Wait, let's let's start. So this is one of those shows I remember watching a lot, but I couldn't tell you the plot of a single episode beyond this first Christmas special which I forgot about and then rediscovered as an adult. Do you guys remember watching this or any of the raccoons cartoons as kids? I, I remember the raccoons existed, uh, them, us growing up in Canada, they would appear on like, I feel like it was one of the local, can, like a TVO, like a TV yeah, it was on, on CBC. I'm pretty sure. Was it the CB, the Canadian broadcasting company? Yeah. Like it that's, was, that's it. That's the one. Okay. Uh, but I don't recall ever watching it, but I remember either flipping by it or just seeing commercials for it. But I don't think I ever watched a full episode. That show was kind of like my, if there's nothing else on on the entire realm of television channels available to me, I guess I'll watch it. But I didn't particularly ever care for it. And just because we are Canadian does not mean it was required viewing, just so you know. Like right. No, I figure that. I just I didn't know how into the Canadian zeitgeist it is compared to American. Because down here it aired on the Disney Channel, so not everybody's getting it. Not everybody knew it existed. I see, but you get a show, an animated show with the kind of like northern type animals with a whole bunch of trees in it automatically think, well, the Canadians must be watching that thing. <laughs> I don't think it was very zeitgeisty. I think, okay. yes, I bet you if you ch talk to children of the 80s, they would recall the raccoons, but I, I don't think it was big using air quotes. That seems to be the general consensus, too. Pretty much everyone I've mentioned this to. Uh, some people get excited about it. Some are like, I remember that happened. But then I discovered this Christmas special as an adult. And this is how this starts. And I remember this, watching this and some other raccoon specials. And eventually they had their full series. Yes. Yeah, because I, I was speaking to my wife about this, who is actually a huge fan of the raccoons. Okay. She actually owns season one on DVD. Oh, wow. No oh. joke. Uh, God. And she, uh, we found her. We watched, yeah, we watched this and she goes, this isn't as good as I remember. And I hardly agreed with her. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, she was under the suspicion that the, the, the Christmas special came after, but apparently then she with through internet research, which she knows how to do. Apparently there was like three, like Christmas type specials before the series even started. Yeah. And this is the first of those. So this is essentially a pilot. almost. Yeah. So they refined it after this. So. <laughs> so this first special aired December 17th, 1980, not on the Disney Channel because that didn't exist yet here, but it was syndicated in the States. So who knows? Uh, eventually, I think Disney got a hold of it and aired it. And I remember liking it. And then I forgot about it. And then I saw it again as an adult. But And I also remembered it being longer than it is. It's a pretty standard 24 minutes, but. This time watching it, it felt like 12. Yeah, it's it, it feels very short. And not to spoil things, it's a little short on plot. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you know, so uh, I was happy it was only 30 minutes, but I did kind of have that as well, where I'm like, oh, we're wrapping this up already. Huh? That was that was fast. That's what happens when you uh, watch these, you know, you know, 
Oh, oh, uh, up and down topsy turvy Christmas specials. You know, they bring you dizzying highs and devastating lows. And before you know it, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> I talk about specials a lot on here that seem to drag on with unnecessary filler. So, yeah, I was surprised that it wrapped up quickly, but I was also thankful that it wrapped yes. up quickly. Yes. Uh, this one could have used maybe a little bit more, but we'll get to that. Uh, let's dive in. We open. We open over the earth depicted as a Christmas ornament hanging on a giant tree floating in space. And I suddenly (laughs) have questions about my entire concept of reality. (laughs) Yeah, that was sort of a deep way to start a show that's ultimately about some woodland creatures. (laughs) And probably confuse a lot of those flat earther people. Oh, yeah. (laughs) There's a star on top of the giant space tree. Shouldn't that be the sun? (laughs) Why isn't the sun burning up the giant tree? Is that other red ornament Mars? (laughs) Many questions. Moving on, we zoom into this ornament earth over the evergreen forest, as told by our narrator, Rich Little. Somewhere on this earth, most likely a ways northward and a short distance past the horizon, Lies the evergreen forest. That was surprising when in the beginning, when you're the credits are happening and it says, as told by Rich Little. First of all, I'm like, how would he have gotten involved with this project, which, as you mentioned, was just kicking off uh, Mm -hmm. this property? But two, it's like, why do you hire Rich Little for his regular voice? You know. I think he's in there for Canadian content for one, uh, but I have to admit it was kind of funny because I ha- half expect him. Okay, when's he gonna kind of throw in a little Johnny Carson in there? You know what I mean? <laughs> My favorite Rich Little thing ever is him in Futurama, where it's it's this is Rich Little's head impersonating Howard Cosell. Yeah, <laughs> which is a great joke. But yeah, to your point, this is the man of a thousand voices, or a man of a thousand voices. I feel like there have been a few of those, but. But here he's just boring, rich little voice, which. Yeah, it feels like if you're going to pay the rich little bucks, you know, you want to use him for where he's going to go off and do effect six, seven different voices. Just to have him read this narration feels a little like. Yeah, if they were smart. They would have had him do all the voices. I mean, (laughs) he had a thousand characters in this thing. He could have easily done like all of them. I know. Well, at that point, a couple years before this special, he had his own version of a Christmas carol where he does exactly that. And it's all a celebrity impression. So it's like Scrooge's W.C. Fields. and The two (laughs) solicitors are Laurel and Hardy. So I'm going to get to that eventually, but. Tiny Tim is the voice of Ronald Reagan. (laughs) (laughs) This is now a rich little podcast. Welcome. (laughs) Yeah, he's doing his boring, normal, rich little voice as he describes the evergreen forest as most likely a ways northward and a short distance past the horizon. Okay. If you're me in Florida, that's a ways northward, but we're zooming in and it doesn't look that far north. Maybe North British Columbia, but they couldn't even zoom into our northern province. <laughs> yeah, like you thought they were making this sound like polar, like, you know, yeah. you're going to be in the north. Po- and then it's just like, oh, man, that's just like Vancouver. We're just in Vancouver <laughs> yeah. here. But fine, they can't help where a forest is. We arrive on the day before the day before Christmas. Happy Festivus, everyone. <laughs> at the cabin home of the forest's chief ranger, voiced by Rupert Holmes. Seems the forest is disappearing. Over half the trees are gone. He's singer-songwriter behind Escape, a.k.a. the Pina Colada song. If you like Pina Coladas. Wow. Really? <laughs> Yes, the forest ranger dad is, if you like pina coladas, Rupert Holmes. That is unbelievable. That's that is a showstopper on a couple levels. Uh, let me tell you there. Uh, can we get to the dad here a little yeah. bit? I mean, this this this, this character is quite fascinating to me because clearly 
he's a single father. There's no mom. There's no mention of mom anywhere. And he leaves the kids alone a lot. <laughs> well, with the dog, but, but yeah, you're right. He leaves the kids <laughs> home a lot in the wilderness. I thought it was like, <laughs> at first I thought they're at his office. They're at a ranger station or something. But he goes to work and he stays there for the day and they call him at work later. And yeah, mom's not into this. So he's left leaving his kids home alone with the dog. And it's a big sheep dog, but still. Apparently half the forest has Mysterio's disappeared. All right, kids go to bed. Daddy's going to go out and check out what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the dead of night. That's the other yes. thing. I, I've yeah. got to go right now. <laughs> it it would have been much better if you actually like pulled a shotgun from out of the closet and just kind of, you know, <laughs> chucked it, you know, <laughs> all right, kids sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy's going to solve a mystery. <laughs> How has there not been a horror movie that started like that? <laughs> it's going to go in a way different direction. This whole cast is a list of, you know, this person. Just all oh wait, but Rupert Holmes as a forest ranger might be my favorite one. Uh, he's Ranger Dan who receives the troubling phone call that is that the fo- his forest that the forest is disappearing, not magically vanishing, but someone's chopping down all the trees. He's got his two kids, Julie and Tommy, who are very worried about the forest disappearing, and like to wear overalls. They sure do. <laughs> I mean, if you live at the evergreen forest, what else do you have but the trees? I mean, there's li- there's nothing else around them. These people. Yeah <laughs> how how long did it take for them to realize? Hey, there are fewer trees than there were. I know. <laughs> I know. It makes you wonder if how if that ranger is uh, ranger dad's doing something else except instead of his jobs during the day. Could be. <laughs> Couldn't see the trees from the forest. Right. Smuggling cocaine in from Mexico or something. <laughs> and who's great. making, who's making this call to the, to Dan at, in the wee hours of the night going, Dan, I'm sorry. It's so late, buddy, but we've just got it confirmed. There's a bunch of trees missing. It's like, right. who is, who is this like forest task force that's at work here? Dad, Dad, it's me, Stan, over here at Tower 37, <laughs> doing the tree watch. I was having a little shut and I opened my eyes, and all of a sudden, thousand trees are gone. We got to do something about it. <laughs> so let's talk about the kids. These two actors playing the kids have a weird connection in that this same year, 1980, both were in movies as children who fall from a great height. So. <laughs> Julie is Tammy Bourne. You can save the Evergreen Forest, can't you, Daddy? I sure hope so, honey. Who was in the horror movie Prom Night as a young girl who falls out a window to her death very early in the movie, and that sets up the whole plot there. And that's almost her entire acting career outside these raccoon specials is Julie. That, I was gonna say, that sounds like a horrible prom. <laughs> <laughs> Prom comes later. Oh, okay. Sorry. I (laughs) I misunderstood the plot. Yeah, well, this was like a flashback, but in the beginning. Uh, And then Tommy is Hadley K. What are you going to do, Dad? Right now, I'm off to start looking for clues. Who was in Superman 2 as the boy who falls off the ledge at Niagara Falls. Wow. Kidding me. What a weird connection. Yeah, he's that kid. And then he grew up and took over at Scooby-Doo for very briefly uh, after Don Messick died. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You're telling, okay, wait. This, we've already got Rich Little, Do You Like Pina Coladas, and the Niagara Falls Fallen Kid? Yeah. This, (laughs) what in the world? (laughs) What's next? (laughs) Well, we'll get there. So these kids go to bed. We see them dreaming of playing outside in the snow, which remember that for later. For now, we pan over to one tree still standing. That's home of the titular raccoons. Can we talk about this dreaming thing? Like, are these two brothers and sisters are so in sync that they simultaneously share dreams with their appears to with their dog? As far as I can, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure what's happening. And we'll talk more about that at the end. But. (laughs) 
They're not twins. It looks like the sister is the older one here. I didn't say She's they were twins. I said they were brother and sister. Well, I know that, but uh, you hear a lot of time about twins sharing dreams and like have some right. kind of mental connection, but. And just because they're wearing overalls as well, you, you think they were twins. I understand. They, <laughs> and they, well, they share one bed because it's a tiny cabin. Clearly. And maybe what did dad give them before they went to bed is the real question here. <laughs> Special cocoa. Yeah. Well, <laughs> daddy's got to go out to investigate these missing trees in the middle of the night in order to get the kids to sleep soundly. Special cocoa. That's right. <laughs> Made with that root he finds out back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Those trees are missing too. Hmm. <laughs> That's why he's so concerned. So we we're in the home of the raccoons. There's Melissa, voiced by singer Rita Coolidge. Perfect. Mistletoe always gets me in the proper Christmas spirit. Who sings a couple songs in here, including the one just before over the kids playing in the snow. You've tucked in the sleepy hands, send them flat off into their dreams. You turn off the lights and you kiss them goodnight. A million things left unsaid, it seems. She's known to me for her work with her then husband, Chris Christofferson, and on her own. Uh, she also writes music and remains uncredited for allegedly co-writing the song Layla. Wow. Uh, didn't she also sing the song for Octopussy? Yes, like, she it's did. All time high. Yep. Like that one? <laughs> that Rita Coolidge is Melissa Raccoon. Somebody's got a poster on their wall while they're podcasting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't have a Rita Coolidge poster? <laughs> I thought everyone did. Melissa and she lived with her husband, Ralph, performed by Bob Dermer, the voice of Grumpy Bear from the Care Bears. It's an outrage! What? Thousands of the forest trees have disappeared! That bear, always so upset. And are either of you familiar with a kid's show called Today's Special? From around oh the same my time. god! Of course, Bob that, Dermer that, was no. He was the puppeteer playing Sam, the security guard. Hey, everybody! Yes. Look, it's a, a woman and a mannequin that's come to life. <laughs> that he was always one of those uh, those Muppet puppet things that uh, kind of creeped me out because they would have human hands, like you would see their oh, yeah. hands, like Swedish Chef. That. Yeah, that was a that was a Canadian classic, so to speak. That was filmed like in a de- an actual department store in downtown Toronto. Oh wow, really? Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, good. That one made its way down here on Nickelodeon, and that aired for years, probably after it stopped actually taping new episodes. But today's special, shout it loud and clear. Today's special. Okay, wait. Let's so let's talk about this. This set up here with these raccoons and you kind of alluded to this off the top uh, yeah. mike but so there's a husband and wife raccoon living with their third wheel buddy yeah so here's the third wheel burt <laughs> raccoon we'll get to his voice in a minute but yeah he seems to be well at first they're asking how did you sleep so it sounds like maybe it was his first night there but then when this becomes a series, they're still living together. Yeah. Right. It's, in my mind, when I thought of the raccoons, I always knew there were three of them. I assumed it was a mom, a dad, and a son. Oh. <laughs> oh. No, it's 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 a wife, a husband, and a useless layabout. <laughs> ah. <laughs> because he comes out, you know, yawn, yawn. That guest bedroom is great. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Boy, and did we have enough of that root last night from the backyard? <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> the raccoons did it. No. Uh, but I had, my wife and I had a roommate that we would rent out a room for for a few years. It's mm. just a fairly unconventional oh, yeah. arrangement for a children's cartoon. You know what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. I. I'm not saying those situations don't happen, but it is it is an interesting creative choice that that's the that's the way they went with it. Right. There couldn't be neighbors living in neighboring trees. 
They had to yes. Look it up. That's- <laughs> I mean, there was enough of those trees at the time until this story point came forward for crying out loud. <laughs> um, but uh, or or make him a like make him a gram coon. You know, it's like the grandpa raccoon is living with them. Like that would make more sense. But just the 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 pal we can't get to leave after three months is just <laughs> funny. <laughs> it would track with this character, but yeah, no, he's just roommate in his hockey sweater who slept in it. <laughs> that's right couldn't he get like an apartment downstairs or something like you know like larry from three's company <laughs> it would make sense if they moved in together after all the trees went down but this is how they start this is how they're introduced right morning bert hi uh, bert how'd you sleep uh, oh, terrific what a mattress what a guest bedroom very for a chic <laughs> what a raccoon dominium so the voice of Burt Raccoon is Len Carlson, who's had quite a voice acting career, starting with the Green Goblin, the original Spider-Man cartoon. Jeez. Uh, and then he was the voice of the animated Swamp Thing. But I personally cannot listen to Burt Raccoon without also hearing a less gravelly version of the voice of Ganon from the Legend of Zelda cartoon. <laughs> Oh, my God. That aired with the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Jeez. I just ruined Burt Raccoon for everyone. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> I want to hear what a swamp thing sounded like. <laughs> I'll have to put it in. I must find a cure to my own growth formula. Or remain trapped as a monster forever. So Melissa's trying to decorate their the inside of their tree for Christmas. Ralph's too busy reading the paper, and Bert has just woken up in time to take a nap. I need to talk about this tree they live in. I don't know. I want to talk about it, too. Good. I don't know (laughs) if it was intentional to make it look much bigger than it was on the inside, because they live somewhere in the top of the tree where it gets thinner. But it messes with my head every time I watch this. Oh, I see. You're talking about the actual reality of living in that tree. I was more interested in talking about the interior decoration of their apartment. Let's do it. <laughs> if you notice, Bert walks out of the, the guest room, you know, shaking off a, a root hangover. <laughs> yep. um, you, can, you can see on the wall, they have a couple of posters. The one I noticed most was that Disco Fox poster. The Saturday Night Fever, but it's a fox. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's got like a white, uh, white gray sideburns on the side of his head. I found found that kind of fascinating. That disco fox, man, he is a cool cat. (laughs) (laughs) No, he's a cool fox. (laughs) All right. Oh, I mean, yeah, the uh, cool fox. (laughs) So, so obviously amongst this forest community, there's some kind of entertainment industry where they actually go out and see movies with other animals in it and then buy promotional merchandise, which is kind of (laughs) neat. Yes. (laughs) And drive in theaters just past the horizon. That's right. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't appear to be a particularly large tree, but inside it's like a very furnished multi-room home. It's like that Bernstein Bears tree that when they're outside, it doesn't look big enough to comfortably house an entire family of anthropomorphic raccoons. And not to get ahead of ourselves, but then there is a plot point that happens to their said treehouse that even throws this size sort of yes. situation more off. <laughs> yeah. Here we are in our TARDIS tree. Ralph reads the news in the paper that the trees are disappearing and he's outraged. Bert makes his maybe they went on Christmas vacation joke. But uh, The other two are very upset at the prospect of their own home being cut down, which happens in a bit. Because we pan outside to see a large span of tree stumps and the one responsible, the evil lumber baron, Cyril Sneer, a cigar smoking pink aardvark voiced by Michael McGee. Look at this fine specimen, ripe and waiting for me to cut it down. (laughs) Now, this is his best known role as far as I'm concerned, but IMDb talked at length about his career as a horse racing commentator. And Wikipedia also made a big deal about a radio character he created called Fred C. Dobbs. I'm not familiar, or either of you. No. No. Okay. I, I, 
I'm not sure if I uh, appreciate the fact how quickly you brushed over the fact that they that Cyril and his son are actually aardvarks. When I was what would watch the show, I had no clue to what kind of animal they were. Oh yeah. On that note, though, aardvarks is sort of a strange adversary for a raccoon. Like you know, it's as of all animals you could have chosen. Uh, yeah, like an aardvark. I mean, I would like, I could understand a moose or a deer or something <laughs> or like, like but, an evil hawk, right. Or a fox per se, but let's, I get, I get, I get it. They make them and they like, they're drawn ugly. Like they're, they're, oh, yeah. they're made to look like the, like, I don't, I never liked the look of, sneer and in these and i know you're not supposed to like villains but in any good cartoon you gotta have a good villain and i always found this i didn't like the look of these aardvarks they're sort of like they look strangely naked (laughs) yeah all of the other talking animals in this besides the dog who's a pet but the raccoons are all wearing some form of clothing but the sneers are wearing bow ties and one's got glasses, and that's it. And that's it. And then they got this like rolly skin, like flaps and everything. It's it's quite unsettling. And they're very pink, so that doesn't help. That just makes them look more naked. <laughs> yes. It's, yeah, it's not. It, it's a once again another weird choice. Yeah. The who's the who's the the nemesis of the raccoons well an aardvark of course (laughs) that's right there you go make that cartoon Uh, and as rich little's narration points out he's accompanied by his college graduate son cedric (laughs) they lead with that for cedric his defining trait is oh he graduated from college what a nerd (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know he's smart because he's wear he wears glasses and he's timid. Yes. <laughs> Loser. Pop, you're already the biggest lumber baron around. Why not ease off? The voice of Cedric is the least known in this one. It's it's Fred Little, no relation as far as I could tell. But this is his only notable role. So no, I hear, I hear that's his younger brother. He is the man of 11 voices. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I I heard it is related to Rich Little, though. Is it? I mean, according to, yeah, apparently, according to, if you if you use the Googles, it, it he is related to Rich Little. Well, all right. <laughs> Phoned in a favor. Hey, can you sound like a wimp? <laughs> sure, it's one of my 11 voices. <laughs> <laughs> I can also do a French guy. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Nerdy, bespectacled, calculator-carrying Cedric is trying to convince his dad that he's already cut down more than enough trees to earn a profit. And he's breaking the law by cutting de- down that much. But Cyril insists there are never enough and chainsaws through another whole row of trees, including the raccoon's home, sending them flying out of the tree. And the tree itself rolls down a snowbank right into the bath of Julie, Tommy, and Schaefer, who decide to take it home as their Christmas tree. And here we get another song. This one is by Rupert Holmes, Mr. Pina Coladas, singing about the perfect tree and that he's coming to stay at our house. The man, the perfect tree. He's coming to live at our house. We're going to put him up at our house. He being the tree. The tree is a he. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I always thought I, I always thought of trees as girls. <laughs> it depends on the, uh, which it, romance language. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas Carol classics. These are not. I no. think it's safe to say. <laughs> and, and for the whole song is like. We're going to put him up in the corner and we're going to decorate him all up. We're going to dress him up like he's a visitor coming for Christmas. It was very strange. I, I, I think I would have liked it more if you actually took like the Pina Colada song, but like, you know, switched it out with tree references in de- <laughs> instead, you know, <laughs> if you let towering sequoias <laughs> uh, needles on the ground. You know? <laughs> 
Uh, but Schaefer the dog helps the kids put the tree on the sled and take it home, and that's what the raccoons see. So they think these two tiny human children and a dog are destroying the forest. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. It's a logical assumption. Of course. Children hate trees. <laughs> We're going to take it home and kill it. Uh, they follow the kids home, pointing out that it's Melissa who's bound and determined to follow them and rescue their Christmas stockings. They just took your house, but no, not the stockings, too. Not the stockings. <laughs> What's yeah, the- so that's that's where thing. Th- this is how what Mike the Tardis tree that you were talking about. Yeah, how in the world is this their home? That this this tree, like a Christmas tree sized tree that goes in someone's living room. This is their house. Like none of this makes sense. I think no, I'm, I'm back on Mike Westfall's team here. Where I want to find out what the heck is in those stockings that they don't give a. <laughs> you know, a care about uh, any of their valuable home possessions and so on. Well, it is, it is almost Christmas. Don't get right. Must be some fighty, mighty fine orange at the bottom of that stocking. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> yeah. Don't grow oranges in the evergreen forest. We have to wait until Christmas just to get those. Right. Well, we cut the Cyril Sneers lumber yard where he's frantically mad about one tree they're missing because they didn't see it roll down the hill and get carried off by the kids. Cedric, of course, is trying to argue it's just one tree. And but as DJ said at the top, money doesn't grow on trees. It is trees. <laughs> Didn't they teach you that in college? Boy, oh boy. I tell you, the one thing that, that strikes me about uh, Cyril Sneer is that this man is a one man wrecking crew. He's practically a logging company on his own. I, earlier, you saw him chop down like 20 trees single handedly. You know, I was surprised when he got to the lumber mill, there were actual workers there for crying out loud. You know, I mean, it's obvious to me that Cyril is like uh, uh, is one of the victims of this current opioid crisis for crying out loud. <laughs> Look at those eyes. They're dark shades around these totally on amphetamines. <laughs> <laughs> Bags under. You know that's his crazy time of year, man. It's it's the before the holidays. That's the lumber. That's the lumber capital of the season, man. Uh, yeah, and it's not even that he's selling Christmas trees. No, he's sawing them in the two by fours. He's making them into two by fours. That was unexpected. Uh, here's a question, though: um, Does he have gold teeth, or is that just a tooth that is turned yellow from his cigar smoking? Oh, just the one. <laughs> no, if it was the cigar smoking, it would probably the yellow teeth would be back in the corner where he puts it. Or all of his teeth would be yellow. I like to think it's a gold tooth. I thought I thought it was a gold tooth, but that's a very good point. It it could very well be just a dead tooth. That- <laughs> <laughs> it was on the side of his cigar smoking lip. Like I will say that it's but I, I like to think to really uh, to maintain his lumber baron sort of uh, vibe is that it's a gold tooth. Yeah, that's what I thought. It makes more sense that uh needs to chop down all these two by fours and sell them so we can afford to have a dental plan. <laughs> right. The Christmas raccoons will return after these messages. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, I like Christmas. Just not all the money people spend on gifts. So this year I've seen to it that gifts are priced so low, even I'd buy them. Ebenezer. (laughs) Scrooge approved prices. Only at Canadian Tire. Scrooge approved prices. It's my little gift to everyone. What a nice gift, Ebenezer. Yes, doesn't cost me a cent. Canadian Tire lets you give like Santa. And save like Scrooge. Now return to a Christmas raccoon. But back at the cabin, the kids finish decorating the tree and then head out to town by themselves to go shopping for a Christmas present for their dad. First off, it's Christmas Eve and they're just shopping now. Secondly, there are a lot of pans across this vast forest and this cabin is the only human structure we've seen so far besides, well, the lumber complex is probably a, an aardvark structure, I'll call it. Where the heck's town? <laughs> yes. And I know there's like these kids, once again, on their own. Dad's still nowhere to be found. 
They're, I mean, what are they? They're getting on a sled and mushing for 300 kilometers to go to the town? <laughs> Walking around in their stupid overalls. <laughs> <laughs> How far do they need to travel in the snow in the wilderness to shop for their dad on Christmas Eve? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, the dog stays inside the house and the raccoons decide to break in through the chimney because it's a Christmas special. And inside, Bert in particular is mesmerized by the now decorated tree. Look at the bright lights and the tinsel. Hey, your home's gone Hollywood. This is where your proportions of the raccoons and their home kind of even are more prevalent for crying out loud. Right? Exactly. These raccoons are essentially the size of the children standing yeah. in front of that fireplace, and their entire house is inside this cabin. This thing is melting my brain. I can't figure this out, man. This <laughs> like weird the, time lord like uh, <laughs> tree house here. It's so crazy. Unless I missed that nature special, which talked about raccoons' natural ability to shrink in size. <laughs> That's it. That's what we don't see once they kind of. Finagle themselves into the pine needles. You don't see them <laughs> shrinking. All right, raccoons, time to go home. You got it. Wow. <laughs> I was say, Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but again, Ralph and Melissa just want to take back their stockings. Never mind their home and all their belongings. Got to get those stockings back. And of course, the dog happens to be lying right at the foot of the tree. And Bert has to make a big deal about, he doesn't scare me. But as Melissa retrieves the stocking, she knocks off an ornament, which crashes to the floor, waking up Schaefer, who chases them around the cabin, knocking the rest of the ornaments off the tree and causing Melissa to drop the stockings as they run for their life out of doggy door. And the next minute or so is a chase scene around the forest and across a frozen lake on which happens to conveniently sit an abandoned ice boat. <laughs> Just, like, <laughs> that, 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 thank you for like uh, us pausing here, because who, wh as we've said, this is pretty remote. We've not really seen anyone else. We We haven't even seen like footprints of any other no. living creature here, but there just happens to be an, ice sailboat just sitting conveniently off the side here for them to grab like th that i remember going this is like the the animators going wait what are we supposed to do here again there is a chase you know it'd be cool man ice boat yeah i didn't do it <laughs> <laughs> raccoons like ice boats oh yeah it's there <laughs> So we get this dizzying first person sequence of an out of control ice boat. It's I like the animation here, though. It's not very smooth, but I like the style of it and how they created sort of a swaying motion. Yeah, those ice boats, they like to sway. <laughs> they <sure do. laughs> but they eventually hit a snowbank and the raccoons take off running down a hill, followed by Schaefer, who trips and finds himself in the old TV trope of rolling himself into a giant snowball and eventually engulfing the raccoons as well. <laughs> Surprised it didn't like roll into a whole bunch of like the Christmas trees and knock them down like, like bowling, bowling pins. pins. Yes. I was waiting for that. <laughs> That's right. Totally missed that opportunity. Stupid animators right there. It could have been, or it could have been like two by fours lying next to, cause they crash into the lumber yard. Nah, it's not the same. Children would have been peeing their pants at that gag for crying out loud. <laughs> Opportunity lost. Yeah, the snowball crashes and breaks, leaving everyone involved dizzy. Bert complaining that his ears are ringing, and Schaefer, no longer within earshot of humans, finally speaks. It's my ears. I think they're broken. I can't stop them from ringing. Oh, mine too. And the voice of Schaefer is Carl Bannis whom you might remember from Rudolph. He was a bunch of the misfit toys, including the spotted elephant. But more importantly, he was the head elf. Oh, yeah. Okay, now I can place that. He's not as loud and angry like, Hermie doesn't like to make toys. But you can hear kind of the, the gravel in his voice. 
Yeah, totally. And that was also a very good voice that oh, you, you just did right there. You should feel proud. But yeah, now that you mention it, I can con- I-, I can hear it for sure. But it's here when Melissa peeks through the window of the building and they realize they find it's Cyril Sneer's lumberyard. And inside he's shouting at his toiling factory workers, all two of them, to speed up cutting <laughs> those logs. Man, they're operating machinery. They can only do that so quickly. <laughs> and then Cyril Snare just steps in and goes, I'll do it and does it himself. He has a one man logging company. Well, why doesn't he just teach the guys that what you got to do is you got to take this lever and you got to move it back and forth and back again and forth and back. <laughs> like, it's, I guess the rest of the guys didn't know you had to crank on this thing multiple times to make it go faster. It's like, it's like a manual car. <laughs> Now the raccoons realize it's not the dog and the kids who are destroying the forest. And here is where they explain to Schaefer they broke into his house to get to their own house. And Schaefer instantly apologizes with a little dog whimper at the end there to bring it home. I never would have chased you if I'd known. Can you forgive me? (laughs) Oh, we can't stay mad at you, good dog. (laughs) Yeah, you you have no eyes. (laughs) (laughs) they always draw sheepdogs like that well i had a sheepdog as a kid and you did barely see their their eyes because their hair just covers it all the time so when i was about two or three i thought my dog just didn't have eyes (laughs) oh you're so stupid yeah (laughs) (laughs) i won't deny that Schaefer and the raccoons become fast friends and begin coming up with a plan to stop Cyril Sneer. The big plan? <laughs> Jump him when he walks out the door. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, because I wanted to, to talk about this plan, because I've written down in my notes here. Their plan is to beat the crap out of Cyril Sneer and strong arm him into <laughs> listening, to, listening to their friggin' ideas. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, I, I guess there's only one thing to do. Get him! Like it's like that. That's pretty much <laughs> pretty much it. Like, that's it, and it works. But that was it. They had this long pan, like skyward, cutting into a commercial, and all they did was, as soon as he stepped out the door, they yeah. jump him. That the last thing I ever expected was for the raccoons to goodfellas this problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know. But I gotta say, I do like a classic dust tornado fight yes. in a cartoon where it's just all the limp like body parts for it, and then it, someone's head sticks out for a second and goes back in. That is like an uh, that's a cartoon trope I do enjoy. Yes. That's at, right. At one point, Melissa stops and throws a snowball at Cyril and he shouts back, You crazy dame! <laughs> just to make it more good fellas I guess Schaefer finally secures both of the sneers by their snouts and Cedric's the one who asks what have we done to you and Ralph launches into it why you two are ecological disasters yeah oh forest destroyers yeah home wreckers yeah I like Bert yards away he's just going yeah a safe distance on the sideline just cheering them on Bert's clearly the Venkman of this group. Go get her, Ray. Yeah. And Sh- and Schaefer is the muscle. And I love the fact that was a S- Cyril Sneer actually has a knot tied into his snout. <laughs> right. Like, he really got the worst of it. Yeah, it was the knot that, that, uh, that finally did it for him. <laughs> but it's at this point that they learn the important lesson about responsible lumbering. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> what is it? What Cedric's going like? I told you we should have stopped at our quota. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Cyril tries. Uh, and it said, "No, it was just to support your college education. Is it a crime for a father to want to give his son a good life?" <laughs> Moving even Bert to tears. Yeah, Bert almost buys it. That <laughs> shiftless layabout. Hate him. <laughs> <laughs> Right, they ask, why pick on him? There are a lot of lumberers. There are a lot of responsible lumberers. They only cut down a few forest creatures' homes, and they replace them with new baby trees. And here is where Cedric finally remembers, 
oh, hey, we should replant the forest. There's money in reforesting. That's right. That's the one day in class that Cedric missed in ecological uh, economics he talked about, right? (laughs) (laughs) But that's enough for him to consider it. uh, But he's hesitant. And that's when the knot comes into his nose by Schaefer. He finally goes, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yes, Cedric, call a seedling supplier. And wow, they really wrapped up the main conflict quickly. Very fast. They do not like having their noses grabbed. Just so you know. Well, (laughs) and it just goes to show you at Christmas time, violence solves everything. There it is. (laughs) Only took 18 (laughs) minutes. Not bad. (laughs) And that is when Schaefer hears the kids calling for him and heads home and spends the night looking out his window at the now homeless raccoon shivering in the snow. Yeah. Boy, those raccoons were trying to make a point, eh? It's just like, you know. Well, well, I guess we have no home, so we'll just find a place to stay warm. Hmm, this spot directly in front of the window to your home seems like a good idea. Well, go. but in the, the raccoon's credit, uh, to their credit here, they, I mean, Schaefer even says, I, I don't have any idea how I could possibly help you guys. And the raccoons are kind of looking at him going, you could like give us the tree back that's sitting in your living room. <laughs> like you couldn't your, your house, our house is in your house right now. Like, so I think they're sitting out trying to make him guilty to go. You guys need that Christmas tree really bad, I guess, but that is still our house. Right. Like, and you've got our stockings <laughs> and, and our stockings. Yeah, the stockings are still in there. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So your tree, our home is in your home, nice and warm, and you have a door in front of the door to your house that we could easily go through and just climb in the tree and disappear. (laughs) They're very considerate raccoons. They don't want to go in and scare the children. Oh, I see. They're already alone without their dad at night. Let's introduce wild animal. That's right. There, I tell you, there's nothing more scary to children than a raccoon with a droopy nose and a hockey sweater on. <laughs> right. The thing of nightmares. But yeah, Schaefer goes inside. The kids are redecorating the tree, asking the dog what happened. And Julie discovers the dropped stocking. So Schaefer grabs one, leads the kids to the window to show them the sad raccoons outside. <laughs> And Julie immediately puts together, maybe our Christmas tree was their home in seconds, figures out what I probably wouldn't have deduced that quickly as a kid or an adult. (laughs) That's right. If that was my cabin, I'd be like, Julie, go get daddy's rifle from the closet. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, did you want to put up the star sad raccoons? (laughs) So Julie calls her dad at work and she's going to and says he's going to find those raccoons a new home. And Schaefer goes out to tell him the news and return their stockings. And then we ripple fade to the kids waking up in their beds, shouting, it's Christmas. Dad's home, sitting, drinking coffee, and the kids peek out in their living room and their tree's not there. And we find out it's not Christmas. It's only Christmas Eve. They never brought home a tree. Remember, the kids were dreaming about playing in the snow, and when we panned to the raccoons and later the sneers, that was still part of the dream. An identical dream both kids and the dog apparently had. What? What? And, like, adding another layer of inception here, they dreamt things that they weren't even present at. Yeah, like, all, all, all of the sneers moments and like the like the, that we saw, like what? How did they? The, how did they the see vicious that? Beating that the aardvarks, uh, you know, uh, were sub- were submitted to by those horrible raccoons and evil dog. I know. Like, the, how did they dream all that? It's Stop like the, their so mutant they're, powers. Clearly, <laughs> it's all That's in the right. same elsewhere snow globe. <laughs> I am a Westfall. Tommy asks his dad if he ever solved the mystery about the disappearing trees. And dad says, it's funny. The trees just stopped disappearing. And overnight, someone mysteriously planted thousands of seedlings, but they don't know who did it. So that happened. And the kids and Schaefer look out the window and find someone planting a tree outside their home. And the same raccoons from their dream 
rejoicing outside their new home and waving at them like they know them. So what part of this was a dream? <laughs> what I am completely like confused now here at this point. This is where I was like, it was a dream. It's not it. Some of it was a dream. Like what? What is happening here? And I'm not I, even sure. I'm not even sure if I'm doing this podcast right now. What's going on? <laughs> Time and reality <laughs> are, are we... meaningless. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm waiting for the mountains to melt away, and Thanos is there, looking like gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. Rich Little tells us the seedlings grew up strong. Some became Christmas trees. Some remained standing. And thanks, all thanks to three raccoons and a dog. And then Rupert Holmes is back to take us out with the song about shaking the sun. Wake up and shake the sun, rise and shine kind of day. You know you've got that glow, chase your shadows away. And we're out. And we, that's what Christmas is all about. <laughs> no, that you should have said it like, that's what Christmas is all about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man uh there must be some theories on reddit as to what it like what what was dream and what was not a dream in the raccoons christmas because it's just like you you kind of come to the end and you're like okay well that happened yeah i get <laughs> this was a very that happened i think the raccoons were dreaming too you know, and all their dreams intersected with those evil aardvarks. They're all, yeah. They're all dreaming. They're all dreaming the they're same all... dream. <laughs> so, yeah, if I was an aardvark, I wouldn't be dreaming about myself getting beat up by a sheepdog, though. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a rough one to wake up to. No wonder they were so happy when they planted the tree. <laughs> Any final thoughts about the Christmas raccoons? I never have to watch it again. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> I mean, somebody must have really enjoyed it because you're right. They did. They made like three more specials and then this kicked off into a fairly long running yeah. show. Um, I mean, it's it's harmless, but it just it, that ending is so perplexing. Like it, it, it's it's. So it, it's like this science sci-fi sort of left turn that leaves yeah. you sort of unresolved that you go, it, okay. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I don't, I wouldn't call it funny. The music is not memorable in any way. Yeah. The, the, the animation is serviceable. So yes, it's Canadian. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think it's, I, I think it's fairly forgettable. Wouldn't you all agree? Yeah, pretty much. I think they're in the matrix. That's what I've, that's my conclusion about this. So that's so in the matrix. We pan out and the aardvark, the raccoons, the kids and the dad are all in like psychogenic chambers dreaming yes. as they're, as a, as the ship flies yeah. out of the ornament into space. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure in the series, they're popping red pills all over the place in that TV series, if I remember correctly. Well, the whole planet's an ornament on that giant space tree. That's right. Now it makes even more sense. There it is. We did it. Yeah. Well, friends, uh, if people want to roll you up into a human snowball, where can they find you on the internet, Christian? Uh, where can they find me on the internet? Uh, if you uh, look on Twitter uh, and look for Hunk Burger, you'll find me doing stuff there sometimes. But more importantly, uh, you can find um, Mr. DiGiovanni and myself on the podcast, the Pop Culture Retrofit Podcast, uh, where we take things from pop culture and retrofit them into other things. It makes more sense when you listen uh, you can download it pretty much anywhere. And almost uh, just recently, Amazon Music is holding uh, is now showcasing the pop culture retrofit podcast. Hey, hey, yes, please listen to the PCR podcast. I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, Michael, where can we find you? Well, in addition to that great plug job for the pop culture retrofit podcast, I'm also the host of another podcast called the Classic Film Jerks. Um, 
Search for that on all the social media platforms and wherever you get your podcasts, you'll find it. But first, listen to the <laughs> Pop Culture Retrofit Podcast. <laughs> and if you have time to listen, then you can look for that other one. I can't remember the name. Start Mike, with- let you go first, Christian. No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Start with the episode where I'm on it and we retrofit Star Wars into soup. And go for <laughs> That's there. a great episode. Oh, boy. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming on here. This was great. My pleasure. Indeed. And you can follow this show on Twitter at Advent Cal House and now on Instagram at Advent Calendar House. Show notes are on the internet at adventcalendar.house. See you all in a couple days. For now, for Christian Nielsen and Michael DiGiovanni, from my former house that's been sliced up into two by fours. This is Mike Westfall saying, save the trees and careful of the icy patch. Hey friend, we'll shake the sun, let's disappear. East and west, they're both the best, but aren't you glad you're here? You're feeling like you should, sunshine and rain. Lock up your hiding place We got a slide in space A side-by-side, it's rainbows away And now, these messages Ho, 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 ho! Merry Christmas! <laughs> Greetings, holiday shoppers. I'm Joseph Wade, and I host a podcast called Christmas Creeps. My band of merry mischief makers and I dissect holiday movies and specials all year round in search of the true meaning of Christmas. So whether you can't resist the urge to watch Home Alone in June, or you worship at the altar of mutant killer snowmen, Christmas Creeps is the podcast for the Grinch in all of us. Check us out at christmascreeps.com or wherever you download podcasts. Next time on the Advent Calendar House... That card I made out to Don Wilson, I can't find it. I wonder where it is. Oh, Clark. Clark. Now what? No! <laughs>